It's my pleasure uh, to welcome everyone here tonight. My name is Jane Tylus. I'm a professor of Italian studies and comparative literature here at NYU. Um, and this is our last official departmental event, I believe, for the academic year. So thank you for being with us on such a lovely night. Um, but we promise we will make it worth your while um, because it's a real uh, privilege and distinction for us to have Professor Ramey Targoff with us as we celebrate her brand new book, Hot Off the Press, from Farrar Strauss and Giroux, Renaissance Woman, The Life of Vittoria Colonna. Uh, this is one of the first books ever written in English on Colonna's fascinating and colorful, and as we'll be hearing, very difficult life. Um, and it will have you spellbound, as you'll see from Professor Targoff's comments shortly. But let me just say by way of introduction that if um, uh, if anyone should be in the business of writing about a Renaissance woman, it's, uh, it's Professor Targoff, who has worn a number of hats in her time at Brandeis, and who has gone on from her work in English to uh, branch out into new areas in Italian. She's currently Professor of English, the Co-Chair of Italian Studies, and the Yehuda Reinhardt's Director of the Mandel Center for the Humanities at Brandeis, three very different kinds of appointments, and the author as well of four previous books, in reverse order, they are Posthumous Love, Eros and the Afterlife in Renaissance England, 2014, and shortlisted for the 2015 Christian Gauss Award with Phi Beta Kappa. Uh, in 2012, she co-edited Thomas Brown's Religio Medici and Urn Burial for the New York Review of Books Classic Series. Uh, 2008, John Donne, Body and Soul. And in 2001, Common Prayer, the Language of Public Devotion in Early Modern England. Professor Togarf has also published a number of articles in PMLA, Representations, Renaissance Drama, Word and Image, among other uh, venues. She's been the recipient of a Guggenheim Award, an ACLS Fellowship, and a resident scholar at the American Academy in Rome. She regularly teaches courses on Shakespeare, on lyric poetry, and on religion and literature in Renaissance England. And we're delighted that she can be with us tonight to discuss her latest publication on Vittoria Colonna. It is for sale upstairs. I see some of you have already uh, purchased a copy, which is great. You can also do so after tonight's event. Uh, and at this point, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Professor Targoff to the stage. Thank you, Jane, for that lovely and generous introduction. And thank you all for coming. And, and thanks to the Casa Italiana for having me. I'm going to begin with a little bit of background, which may be more necessary for some of you and less necessary for others, but a little bit of background about who Vittoria Colonna was and how I came to write this book. And then I'm going to read to you from one of the chapters. Um, so six or so years ago, I was finishing the book that Jane uh, just mentioned on Renaissance love poetry. Ooh. Maybe we could turn down the lights a little bit. Um, and a colleague asked me if I was doing anything with the poems of Vittoria Colonna. And I confess, and I confess to you, that I had never heard of Vittoria Colonna <laughs> at the time. Um, I decided to take a look based on his recommendation. I couldn't find a modern edition of her poems available in Italian, let alone in English. Um, she was out of print. I did find a volume of her poems from 1538 available at the Houghton Library at Harvard, which is right near where I lived. And uh, this turned out, as I soon discovered, to be a landmark book. It was the first book of poetry ever published in Italy by a woman, her 1538 uh, Rime. So I went to the Houghton Library at Harvard and really not knowing what I was going to find. And uh, when I read her poems that day, I probably spent maybe two days there reading her, I was really so surprised. I was taken aback. I was, I had never read a woman who wrote with such emotional intensity. Uh, she was very frank. She was very honest. She struggled with things that I never imagined people talking about uh, in the 1530s in formal Petrarchan sonnets. And I became curious about who she was and what kind of a life she'd led. I soon discovered from the really very few sources that I could find a Wikipedia page, an encyclopedia entry in Italian, and so on, um, that she'd had, even from these very few sources, that she'd had a truly extraordinary life. 
So not only was she the first woman ever to publish a book of poems in Italy and arguably the most famous woman writer of the Italian Renaissance, but she was also a member of one of the most powerful households in Italy, the Colonna family, who are still occupying central Palazzo in the center of Rome. She was the wife of one of the leading Spanish noblemen, uh, Ferrante Davalos, whose family was part of the Aragonese kings who came over to rule the kingdom of Naples. She was probably Michelangelo's closest friend. Uh, the letters and poems that the two of them exchanged suggest a closeness and intimacy that is rarely glimpsed between a man and a woman who are not married to one another during the period. And when she died, he said that he was in mourning for three years. She was on a first name basis with multiple popes, with the Holy Roman Emperor, with the French Queen Marguerite de Navarre, with really almost every significant person that you can think of when you think of early 16th century Italy. She was a patron of arts who commissioned works from Titian, one from Michelangelo, which he then handed over to Pontormo. But so she was moving in the highest artistic circles. She was a devout Catholic uh, who became involved in Lutheran reform uh, circles and was ultimately put under investigation by the Inquisition after her death for Protestant heresy. So it's no exaggeration, I think, to say that she was, as my title suggests, the consummate Renaissance woman who was involved with and, and influenced nearly every aspect of life during this period, whether it be art or literature or religion or politics. Um, Vittoria Colonna was somehow connected. So I often say she's like Forrest Gump of the Renaissance, if you remember that movie, except she was more actively engaged. She wasn't just sort of there when things happened, but she was an active participant. So I learned the bare outlines of Vittoria's life from the sources that I found, um, but then there was an odd silence um, or void. The only decent biography, a very dull biography, um, but it had, you know, factual information, and it was written in 1882 in German. It had been translated into Italian, which is how I read it, but never in English. Her very extensive correspondence uh, was also available in a very inadequate edition from the 1880s in Italian, uh, never translated either, and was missing many, many letters that, that subsequently came to light. And as I've already mentioned, her poems were no longer even available in a modern edition. So what I had come upon, for those of you who are academics or have done research projects, was a kind of dream situation. Um, I had found an immensely important and significant historical figure. She's really the Italian equivalent of Emily Dickinson, um, about whom not nearly enough has been written from a biographical perspective. So I decided to tell her story myself. Over the next few years, I traveled to every place that she lived in Italy. And this uh, required quite a lot of travel from her husband's family's uh, fortified castle on the island of Ischia, where she spent most of her marriage, to Ercole d'Este's ducal palace in Ferrara, uh, including several convents. She mostly lived in convents um, for the last 20 years of her life. And uh, I even stayed in one of these convents, uh, a very memorable visit a couple of summers ago, which is a story of itself. I also spent a lot of time pouring over letters and documents that I found in a number of different archives in Italy, including the Colonna's family archive, which is in a Benedictine monastery in the town of Subiaco, around an hour outside of Rome. And I also, after much work and labor, uh, got into the heavily guarded archive of the Inquisition, uh, which is in the Vatican, and, and only recently opened to the public, and then only in a very it was a sort of Kafka-like experience to get in there. But once I got in there, uh, it was certainly worth, worth uh, the work. So much of what I was doing involved simply making accessible, transcribing manuscript pages that, that were still in Renaissance hand, and then translating. So making accessible traces of Vittoria's life that had been neglected for centuries. None of this had ever been printed let alone sort of published and put in a form that we could use. So this was almost like being an archeologist. I was digging up what I could from the past. The next step was to make sense of what 
I was finding, often partial, incomplete, tantalizingly suggestive, but, but finally inconclusive pieces of evidence where I would find lots of things around an event, but it was missing one crucial piece of paper that was lost. So in those cases of which there were quite a few, I felt less like an archaeologist than a detective trying to make sense. Um, for example, reading backwards, which I did a lot. So I would have a letter that the Pope wrote to Vittoria granting her permission to live in her own house with five women and to keep mass and so on. But I didn't have her letter making the request. Or I had a letter that I found in the archive in Subiaco from her brother's secretary saying, I'm as puzzled and angry as you are. She always seemed to love her family. How could she have done this to us? Um, you know, I'm going to make sure we fix this. Referring to the fact that she had left the bulk of her money to someone who was hidden from our knowledge. She is a very complicated, long, interesting story, but she had sort of named someone in a secret document that she had locked up in Venice and said her brother wasn't allowed to know who it was. Um, so that piece of paper in Venice has never been found, but we have the brother's angry reaction. And then I found actually in the secret archive of the Vatican, that's its official name, which is where the Pope uh, keeps his papers, I found a letter from the person that she gave the money to saying, fine, I'll give you, to her brother, the money so that you can pay your daughter's dowry. But this isn't what your sister wanted. So in other words, I couldn't figure out where, where the, where, what went wrong in that story? I've tried to reconstruct it in, uh, in a chapter of my book. But these are all just some of the examples of trying to create a narrative with the materials I had without, this is not a work of fiction, it's a work of history, without skipping any of the steps. Um, and so that was a very, um, a very rich and interesting experience. So, I hope in the end I've managed to conjure up much of what this amazing woman's life was like. And I'm just going to give you a little taste of the book. And then I think Jane and I are going to have a bit of a conversation before we open things up. But I'm going to read to you from the second chapter of the book, which is called Donning Widow's Weeds. Viterbo is a walled city with many gates. There's no record of exactly where Vittoria arrived in early December 1525 when she and her entourage stopped in Viterbo, roughly 50 miles north of Rome, on their way to Milan, but it's certain that she traveled no farther. Awaiting her was a messenger bearing the tragic news that her husband Ferrante had died. How it was known that she would be arriving at Viterbo that day, or whether the messenger had been waiting for her for some time is not clear. Perhaps there was an available itinerary of sorts, or perhaps there were simply networks of servants who knew the comings and goings of their masters. Legend has it that upon hearing the news, Vittoria promptly swooned and fell off her horse. It's hard to believe that Vittoria was actually making the journey from Naples to Milan on horseback. Women of her class did regularly ride horses. One of the grandest of all Renaissance ladies Isabella d'Este, Marquesa of Mantua, described many such trips in her personal letters. But for a trip of this length, Vittoria was more likely to have been traveling either by mule or by carriage. Carriages had only recently come into vogue as a mode of transportation and were specifically used by aristocratic women. They spread next to clergymen and finally to noblemen in the latter half of the 16th century. The detail of Vittoria's falling from her horse may simply have been invented to enhance the story. Falling from a mule or fainting inside a carriage has a less dramatic ring. <laughs> Legend also tells us that it took her two hours to revive. When Vittoria recovered from her state of shock, she found herself confronted with a set of difficult decisions. She was 35 years old, a widow, and childless. This last detail, her childlessness, was perhaps her greatest source of sadness. She wrote about her infertility on several occasions in her surviving letters and poems and tried to cheer herself up with the idea that although she had not given birth to Ferrante's child, she had at least borne his fame. In one sonnet, she declares, sorry, I don't know how we got so far ahead here. 
Our bodies were sterile, our souls fecund, and his valor combined with my name makes me mother to his glorious offspring, which lives immortal. It's difficult not to hear in these lines a note of self-justification. The principal aim of marriage within the Italian aristocracy was to produce an heir. Her match with Ferrante had been, in the most fundamental sense, a failure. The terrible burden of having failed to provide her husband with children was compounded by Vittoria's feelings of inadequacy given Ferrante's long history of infidelity. Already within the first year or two of their marriage, he fell in love with the beautiful Isabel de Requens. Sorry, where is The wife of Don Ramon de Cardona, Viceroy of Naples, whose splendid portrait can be seen today at the Louvre. Although Ferrante's passion seems to have been unrequited, it was widely known in Neapolitan society and became a source of great embarrassment for Vittoria. At a grand party in Naples thrown by Isabella d'Aragona, the daughter of King Alfonso II, Ferrante had embarrassed himself with behavior worthy of a besotted teenager. According to a 16th century chronicler, the equivalent today of a gossip columnist, Ferrante stole a kiss from his beloved Isabel and scribbled a short love poem to her in the form of a Spanish song on the surface of the tambourine that one of the musicians was playing. The chronicler also reported that Ferrante had been so bold as to give Isabel one of Vittoria's necklaces, a beautiful string of pearls and precious gems. Isabel supposedly returned the necklace directly to Vittoria <laughs> with a note advising her to keep better watch over her jewelry. <laughs> Several years later, Ferrante fell madly in love with a noblewoman from Mantua named Delia, one of the ladies in waiting to Isabella d'Este. We don't have a portrait of her, but I just brought this portrait of Isabella d'Este. This time, there seems to have been a full blown affair. We know a little bit about it, or at least about Ferrante's feelings, from the letters he exchanged with one of Isabella's courtiers, the humanist Mario Aguicola, who served as his go-between. Ferrante mentioned enclosing secret letters for Delia inside his letters to Aguicola, and confessed to his friend that Delia was the source of all my well-being, my every lofty thought, and every grace. In the last letter exchanged between the two men, Ferrante also expressed his fervent hope that he would see Delia again before he died. There are no similar letters from Ferrante declaring his love or desire for Vittoria, and judging from everything we know about their marriage, they were not well suited. Ferrante was at heart a soldier who thrived on military conquest. There are few signs of his having much of an intellectual life, and his moral compass was at best mutable. <laughs> Vittoria was a quiet and strict young woman whose favorite activities seemed to have been reading and praying. At the time of their marriage, Ferrante spoke only Spanish. According to his biographer, Paolo Jovio, his clothes were always in the Spanish manner, and he always took great delight in that language. And Vittoria knew only Italian. Ferrante was dashing and passionate. Here's a portrait of him attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. Jovio described him as, quote, handsome to look at in the flower of his age with a beard that stood out for its reddish tint, his aquiline nose, his eyes large and full of fire. Vittori's appearance was much less fiery and by all accounts more severe. According to Jovio, she had raven black hair with gold highlights, arched brows, and a wide forehead. He praised her mouth smoothed out in accordance with good manners in a rather fleshy chin, and her nose is having a very slight bridge, which he conceded could convey a manly aspect, but does not deprive her of any feminine beauty, even though it gives her a stern look. <laughs> Another contemporary described her more frankly as, quote, not being a great beauty, but distinguished instead by the virtues of her soul. The most striking portrait of her by the great artist Sebastiano del Piombo and dated sometime around 1525, confirms these impressions. Vittoria is depicted as a serious young woman with a rather large frame that looks as if it was carved from a block of stone. Although she meets the viewer's eye, she seems to do so with some reluctance, 
and there's nothing remotely seductive or coy about her. As with other members of their class, the match between Ferrante and Vittoria had not been their choice. Indeed, to make a marriage between two noble families in 16th century Italy was closer to negotiating a treaty between nations than to forging a domestic union. The engagement had initially been agreed upon sometime between 1495 and 1497, when Ferrante was between six and eight years old and Vittoria one year younger. And here's just one page of the 19-page marriage contract that I found in a big pile of things uh, in, um, in Subiaco. The union formed part of the new alliance between the Colonna family and the Kingdom of Naples, following Vittoria's father Fabrizio's entering the service of the Neapolitan king, Ferdinand II. Ferrante's family, the Davalos, had arrived in Italy with the first Spanish kings in the mid-15th century and had risen to be one of the most powerful households in the reign. I'm skipping over now on account of their early marriage. All of this must have seemed like the very distant past as Vittoria reconciled herself to her new status as a widow on that late autumn day in Viterbo in 1525. She was not only now a childless widow, but also a very wealthy one. Given that both of her parents had recently died, her father Fabrizio in 1520 and her mother Agnese in 1523, and we don't have a picture of her parents, but these are her grandparents. Those are her mother's parents. Um, given that both of her parents had recently died, her sizable dowry would be returned directly to her. She found herself, therefore, in an extremely unusual position of independence. Although her brother Ascanio had taken her father's place as head of the family, and although her husband's cousin, Alfonso Davalos, would be named his heir, neither man was officially authorized to make decisions on her behalf. For the first time ever, Vittoria's life was hers to shape. The most obvious choice to make was to remarry. Her age, admittedly, was not ideal. According to a census done of 15th century Florence, only one in 10 widows between 30 and 39 remarried. But Vittoria was no ordinary widow, and from the perspective of the marriage market, she must have feared, like Odysseus's Penelope, having many suitors to ward off. For Vittoria did not want to remarry, and there was no one to force her to do anything against her will. Although she left behind no explanation for her decision, there are three very different but equally compelling ways to understand her resistance. First, she was still passionately tied to Ferrante. Despite how ill-suited he was for her temperamentally and his frustratingly long absences and infidelities, everything she ever wrote in her letters and poems suggests that she was deeply devoted to him. In a letter from August 1524 to her friend, the papal secretary, Gian Matteo Giberti, she described how angry she was about gossip that had reached her about Ferrante and about their marriage. She was ill at the time, but explained that her illness was not due entirely to her poor physical health. What they blame me for, maddeningly, she wrote, and what needs to be cut out at its root in order for me to be well, is the idea that the Marquis is not worth what he is worth, that we are not two in one flesh, and that I should not be so obliged to him as I am. And here's just a page, just so you can see what I'm talking about when I said I was transcribing a uh, scribbled hand. Um, that's, that's what the letter looks like in its original. This is the only instance in Vittoria's surviving correspondence in which she spoke frankly about what people thought of her marriage. And she affirmed in the strongest terms the depth of her and Ferrante's bond. Despite rumors to the contrary, she insisted that they were one flesh. The Italian phrase due in carne una is similar to the language used in the marriage ceremony, so it's our equivalent of one flesh. To be Ferrante's widow then was a way for her to keep their marriage alive and preserve its memory in the best possible terms. This is what we might call the romantic explanation for her decision not to remarry. And the best proof of it comes in the hundred or so sonnets she wrote to him after his death. The second possible explanation for her decision pulls in the opposite direction. We might call it the anti-romantic or feminist position, namely that the very last thing she wanted was to be tied down by another man. After years of feeling that she was not free to move around as she liked, 
The idea of being unbeholden to anyone had a strong appeal. Why would she want to submit to the will of another husband when she could finally live on her own? This may sound like a projection of a modern sensibility onto someone from a di very different world, but there's ample evidence that Victoria came to treasure her freedom. She never settled down in a single place. She moved, in fact, almost every two or three years, and her own interests dictated where she went and with whom. There were a few occasions when conflicts involving her family compelled her to take refuge at the Colonna Castle in Marino or another family home, but these were exceptions to her normal pattern, and she typically left as soon as she could. Otherwise, when she wanted to visit a particular friend or follow her favorite preacher from one city to the next, there was no one to stop her. In a letter from 1512, she had complained about being restricted by the roles of both daughter and wife. In 1525, Vittoria was about as free as any Renaissance woman could be. The third reason, and ultimately perhaps the strongest, for Vittoria's not wanting to remarry was her desire to lead a predominantly religious life. It was by no means unusual for someone like Vittoria to be very devout. Indeed, Renaissance Italy was saturated with religion to a degree difficult to imagine today. But Vittoria was unusually focused on her faith. And in the aftermath of Ferrante's death, she wanted to put her religious practice at the very center of her existence. The clearest evidence for Vittoria's desire to lead a life shaped at its core by religion lies in the company she kept, the places she lived, and the way she spent her days. These are, in effect, the stories at the heart of this book. But in the immediate moment of confronting Ferrante's death, and pondering what to do next, Vittoria's first decision already revealed the path she most wanted to take. She did not go to his funeral in Milan, where Ferrante's corpse was laid out at the Gothic church of San Pietro and Giuseppe with Real Pompa, or royal ceremony. In fairness, even had she wanted to attend, she may have been too late. Instead, she returned to Rome, where she promptly took up residence as a guest in the convent of San Silvestro in Capite. The decision to stay in a convent during her initial period of mourning was not uncommon. The nunnery was the Renaissance equivalent of a retreat. And there were at San Silvestro in Capite, as in nearly all monasteries, special quarters reserved for guests. Vittoria would have been welcome to pray with the nuns in their daily services, but also free to come and go as she pleased. The choice also meant that she avoided returning home with her brother Ascanio. Ascanio was a notoriously difficult man. Many thought he was completely mad. And although Vittoria remained connected to him throughout her life, she saw his weaknesses very clearly. Ascanio, for his part, showed no resistance to leaving Vittoria, at least for the time at the convent. Who knows if he wanted to live with his pious sister any more than she wanted to live with him. And all would perhaps have been fine if Vittoria had not done something shocking. After settling into her rooms at the convent, to the great astonishment of just about everyone, she evidently asked permission to remain there permanently. Vittoria wanted to become a nun. Thank you. So should, we'll take seats here? OK. Thank you so much, Ramey, for this wonderful introduction to your book. Um, yeah, the you lights are really... turn that off, actually. Is there a way to do that? Because I don't think we need this, probably. Yeah, the light on the um, That's projector. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Um, no, I think you've got a good taste from um, uh, this reading just now. What a wonderful book this is. Um, not simply how original and beautifully researched, but gorgeously written, um, a very compelling story, um, and uh, a very important story, I think, in all, in all kinds of ways. And so I want to just start with where you started, which is to say that your book really kind of opens up. I know you started reading chapter two, with the, you know, when she gets to be terrible and, find out, and finds out that Ferrante is dead. But the book actually starts uh, a few days or a few weeks earlier on the island of Ischia, um, where the messenger approaches the fortress of the Colonna on the beautiful island of Ischia, uh, just off the coast of Naples, to tell her that Ferrante is very sick and is dying. 
And so there's, we, we get the lead into the, to, to the island, to the castle. We're wondering what the contents of the messenger's letter is. And I guess my question really is, is this as a, as a kind of first um, question about the book. You start the book with this dramatic scene when she is, as you say, 35 in 1925, in, in 1525, sorry, <laughs> not 1925. Um, and you know she is as Dante was when he began the Commedia, right? Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, right? I mean, it's you're, you've picked a kind of interesting moment in yeah. Medias Reis, and although you allude a little bit to her life before this moment, you know the vast majority of the book is really is really after this moment. And so I guess my first question is, it's just really a curiosity. Are you doing this because you're 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 really saying that Vittoria Colonna can only become Vittoria Colonna after? Uh, Ferrante's death, and this is where you want to start us and, and, and remain us focused for the rest of the book, or is there really not much material prior <laughs> to his death um, that one can really work with and come up with a, a compelling narrative? Yeah, and I, I thank you for that question. Is this on? Yeah, I think so. I think that in some ways it's a combination of both. Uh -huh. um, the reason, one of the reasons there's a lack of material is that she didn't have a particularly interesting life until, until her husband died. But I mean, there are two different questions. There's a writerly question in your question, which is, where does one begin a book? And how do you start to tell a story? And I was resistant to the sort of cradle to grave biography. Um, had she had a fascinating childhood, I would have. But I thought, precisely on the sort of Dante model, like, where does this life sort of open up? You know, where does this person become someone that we want to be reading about? And that really happened when she became a widow. Uh, so however sad and she was sad. She was in mourning for seven years uh, after her husband died. Uh, however sad she was, it was a great gift to the rest of us um, <laughs> that her husband died uh, because she went on to live this extraordinary life. So I thought as a writer that that's where the story got interesting. That's where you would want to know who this person was. And then when I talk about what we do know about her early childhood, I do it in a kind of for shorthand, I'll say flashback, but sort of thinking back to things that we know. But to the second point, we don't have a lot of information. We have, you know, fewer than a dozen, not even, maybe we have six or seven letters, you know, so really very few letters. We have one long poem, which I do talk uh, quite a bit about. Um, we just don't have much material at all. So it, it would be a kind of blank, set of blank pages, or it would require a kind of imagining making things up based on sort of very scant materials, which I really didn't want to do. So I thought the life that she ended up having starting at that moment was actually quite documented if you looked around. I mean, there was a, enough material, but the rest of it is kind of conjecture. She was clearly very educated. She was reading Latin. She was writing fancy Petrarchan poems. Um, we don't really know who taught her, but we know we can kind of imagine the circumstances because of where she was living and so on. So there's a lot of conjecture and I, I folded that in, is what I would say. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's great. And you, you, know, you just mentioned the Petrarchan poems. And so I want to ask you a little bit about that too. Um, you had mentioned that she wrote about 100 poems after Ferrante dies. Um, and he was, she was in mourning for seven years. Of course, we also just heard from you that he had these paramours, you yes. know, some more serious than others. He was the red-bearded soldier who spoke Spanish. She was a devout you know, Italian woman who was both Italian. And, um, you know, she said they, they weren't necessarily a good match. And so, you know, I guess, I, I, and, I, and I've read Vittoria Colada, you know, for a number of years in terms of her poetry. And I've always had this question, and, and you're in a better position to answer it than anyone else I know, which is how sincere can we assume these poems to be? I mean, you know, Petrarch is the famously insincere writer, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Of, of poems to a woman that perhaps he never really even knew. Um, whereas, obviously, she was married to Ferrante for, what, almost 15 years, and so there's a real sense in which there was a life that was shared, and they really could be sincere. But I suppose, uh, again, as, he's, as, as, as the mourning period goes on, as she continues to, to kind of churn out this poetry, and then eventually move away from poems to her husband, to poems to God, her Rémi Spirituale, um, is that a move toward a more sincere kind of poetry, or do you see them both working more or less within the same register of, again, you know, it, it, it's a question we can ask about all poetry, uh, especially love poetry. And uh, Petrarch is famously accused by, in his little memoir he writes where he's having a conversation with St. Augustine, St. Augustine accuses him 
of falling in love with Laura because her name rhymes with so many things. And, you know, and so, you know, like had she been named, you know, Susan, this wouldn't have happened. So, you know, um, but what I would say is that I, and this gets back to the, my experience, my sort of aha or lateness at the, at the Houghton Library that day, that when I read her poems, I really felt much more than I thought these are brilliant poems. I thought these are sincere poems. So why did I have that impression? So first of all, her very sort of self-deprecating, um, depressive, melancholic, the poems are just really repetitive. Um, they are not moving forward. I'm actually in the middle of translating these poems. Uh, I'm on poem 112 out of, there are actually 125 of them roughly. And I can tell you that, you know, <laughs> you've read 10 of them, you've read uh, 50 at least. Um, so she is repetitive in her grief. But the very first poem, the poem that is always positioned first uh, in the manuscripts as well as the printed poems, starts, I write only to, to vent, the verb is sfogare, which is like what you do to vent a room, like to let the air out, to, to vent my inward pain. And I take seriously that gesture in part because she never wanted these poems to be published. That's clear. She, the poems, when they were published, were published in a pirated edition. And the publisher writes a letter to the reader saying, I am finally giving to the world the sonnets that everyone has been wanting to read. I thought it was better to make happy so many men than to offend one woman. <laughs> so, you know, he basically gathered them, and they're full of mistakes, the poems that he gathered and printed. So the point is that 1538 edition that I found at the Har Harvard Library is actually riddled with errors because she didn't supervise it, nor did she ever in the subsequent 12 editions that were published while she was still alive, did she ever intervene to make corrections. So someone who actually is ambitious, let's say as a poet, um, would have had a lot of opportunities to do that, uh, to, to get involved and to correct the poem. Second thing is, the, the, the person who wrote her husband's biographer, this uh, man named Paolo Giovio, also wrote an account of time he spent on the island of Ischia soon after her husband died. It was around a, a, a year and a half later. He was there for some time. And he describes finding her in her rooms all day long. She, everyone else was going out and having walks and, and sort of hunting and swimming. And she would stay inside and pray all day and mourn and self-flagellate. So she was beating herself. And, um, he talks about how she can't get out of her mourning, that she's stuck in her mourning. And um, Bernardo Rota talks about that as well. So the people around her were describing her as really stuck. And then one of the things that happens over the course of the poems to get to the spiritual poems is that she herself, like me translating her, starts to get bored with all this moaning. <laughs> and she says, you know, isn't there better work to be done? She says that at some point. Migliore opere. She literally says, I want to do better work. So, you know, at a certain point, you watch her kind of, I mean, I think that Freud essay on, on remembering, repeating, and working through. I think she's working through. And, you know, instead of working through just by being a widow, she's writing sonnets. But I, I see the sonnets as a kind of therapy. And um, she says, I want to turn to do something sort of better, more meaningful, more rewarding. And then the first sonnet that she writes, which is the, forms the, the manuscript she gave to Michelangelo, her spiritual sonnets were a gift to Michelangelo, she actually exchanges all of her, you know, her ink is exchanged for Christ's blood. Her pet, you know, I mean, she goes through this sort of transformation of herself as a love poet or as a, a secular poet to a religious poet. And so I would say that throughout the, her poetry, I see a lot of sort of real commitment and not, not a kind of posturing for, for fame or for some kind of attention. Yeah, no, that's a great point you make about the fact that 12 editions of her poems come out, and she really doesn't want to have anything to do with how those poems look. Yes. So I think, I think that's, no, I, I agree. I think that's a really crucial point. Now, now you left this, this group with a, with a real cliffhanger from your reading, you know, she went into, if she went into a nunnery, she wanted to become a nun. Can I spoil that and let yes. them know? Yeah, okay, absolutely. so, so um, she doesn't become a nun. Um, and I think that what is fascinating to me about so much of the, of the remaining, you know, the majority of your book after you get through chapter two is defining this kind of restless spirit in, in Colonna. And she herself acknowledges yeah. this. So for example, there's one, um, there's one letter to Cardinal Reginald Pohl, who she adopts kind of late in, in life as her, as her son, and that's a fascinating chapter in and of itself. 
But she says, you know, until I met you, and this is a direct quote from her letter to Cardinal Paul, my body was continually moving to find inner tranquility and my mind in constant agitation trying to find peace. Um, and you stress a great deal, not only how she was constantly on the move from a mental and perhaps emotional point of view, but also just a physical yeah. point of view. I mean, she's not allowed to be a nun. I mean, and again, this is a fascinating story that you might want to tell too, but I guess, I guess my question is as you, as, you, as you go through the book and you explore what you call at another moment, the tension that she has between, on the one hand, wanting to be involved in the things of the world. You know, she's a wealthy woman, she's from one of Italy's most important families, aristocratic families. So this, this tension to, to wanting to be involved, and on the other hand, she wants utter isolation, she wants to be a nun. So, so we see her constantly going back and forth in the remaining 22 years of her life. Um, would you say this kind of restlessness is, is, is characteristic of this early modern moment in which Many, many Christians. I mean, we're, you know, we're in the nine, we're in the saying 1900s, <laughs> the 1530s, the 1540s. You know, this is the heyday of the Reformation. This is, as you point out, too. This is the heyday when it's not yet quite necessarily illegal to be leaning toward Protestantism, right? The Council of Trent wouldn't even begin until 1542, 1543. So there's this there's this 22, 23 year period almost of of grace, to use one of Luther's words, in which many Catholics were testing the waters. And Colonna seems to be one of them, and, and many, many Italians were testing the waters with her. And so I guess it's this kind of restlessness, both physical and emotional, physical and spiritual. Um, is, this, is this unique to, to Vittoria, or, is this, or do you see this as characteristic of, of life in Italy in this period before the church really closes the door on the Reformation? Yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful question, and it's, it's hard to say how symptomatic she was, but Certainly in her world, the people around her were actively struggling to decide how much of Lutheran reform they were going to admit in and what they could tolerate, basically what the church could tolerate. And this was, I mean, really all of Western European history could have gone in another direction. So the man that she was writing that letter to, Reginald Pohl, who was the nephew of Henry VIII, um, who had refused to support the divorce. The, the divorce, um, and uh, had escaped to Italy, this person was basically a Protestant. He was a sort of moderate Protestant, um, but he was a Protestant. He believed in the central tenets of Lutheranism. He came two votes shy of becoming Pope. Two votes. He had had his papal garments made. That's how sure he was he was going to become Pope. And then he went on to become Archbishop of Canterbury. So when else in the history of the West could the same person lead two faiths who were at war with each other? You know, so this is to say, this is the more general historical question. This was a time when people were asking questions about their faith that had never been allowed to be asked. Um, the Bible was circulating for the first time in Italian rampantly. There were lots of translations, so people had immediate access. However, I want to say that Vittoria was a particularly anxious person and was particularly troubled. And I don't think we can explain it entirely because of the culture she was living in. Um, there's a very interesting moment when she's, she's ill. She struggled with her health a lot, but she's ill quite near the end of her life in the, in the early 1540s. And you know, whatever is going on in her life, the most excellent people always come to help her. And you know, she's just sort of someone who's sort of surrounded by um, really talented physicians and you know, whoever it is. But so they, they sent for the most famous physician who discovered syphilis, you know, to come treat Vittoria Colonna from, from Verona. And he arrived and he wrote a letter to her secretary or to her friend, whoever was taking care of her, I can't remember who it was. And he says, I'm afraid the Marchesa is suffering less from a disease of the body than of the mind. And that's a really interesting thing to say. She needed a psychiatrist. She needed, you know, she was starving herself. Um, <laughs> literally, she wasn't eating. Uh, someone had to come get her to eat. So this was someone who was really struggling. One of the things that she, she didn't get to become a nun um, because the Pope wouldn't let her. That's another story where I've made as much sense of it as I can, but we're missing some crucial pieces of information. Um, but she then lived in nunneries really all the time. So she would go, for example, up to Ferrara, uh, and she was invited to stay at the Ducal Palace, which some of you might say is a beautiful place to stay. And she said, no, I'll visit you here, but I want to stay in that nunnery up the road. Um, and so she did. But guess who was staying at the Ducal Palace right before she arrived? John Calvin. So you know they were reading Calvin's Institutes. So this was a moment of tremendous power. So I, I guess I would say that she's 
a historical figure who, like the best historical figures, who is both a product of her time, but also exceptional in her time. And, you know, many people in her circumstances weren't having the struggle she was. But she was reading Luther, she was reading Calvin, and she was asking questions. And that, you know, created a kind of unrest that I think is, is unusual. Yeah, no, and I mean, she was reading Calvin and Luther, and yet she wanted to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Right. She <laughs> had relics, obviously. She was self-flagellating. Um, she was writing about the Virgin Mary. I mean, so it's, it's just really interesting to think about how, how wide her devotional practices and, and meditations were. Yeah. Again, in a moment where it was possible without necessarily being labeled a heretic, although, again, I think one of your most interesting discussions is, is, is at the end, when you went into the records of the Holy, the secret, the secret Vatican records of the Holy Inquisition, um, and find this whole, this whole documentation about the fact that she, her poems were actually being marked up after her death by an inquisitor who wanted to figure out how heretical it was shaped. So again, it's just this, this wide range of, of religious behavior and sentiment is, is really striking. So you mentioned that she's a product of her era, but also a very exceptional person. So let me bring in the most famous name in the book, probably, um, which is Michelangelo. Um, who was also, to an extent, a product of his era, as well as a truly exceptional individual. And at one point, you used the phrase that they considered themselves equals, that they were that they were kind of soulmates or friends. And I was struck by this because there's a number, as you know, Michelangelo's sonnets to uh, to, to Colonna. Often they accompany a drawing that he'll send or some fruit, or you know, there's, there's this wonderful process of gift giving that accompanies the sonnets. But he always talks about her in terms of you give me too much, I can never give you a proper gift. Um, you know, he doesn't call her an aristocrat, but clearly, you know, he's thinking in, in class terms, right? He's very conscious, I think, of their class differences. And yet also, again, perhaps, you know, overly, being overly modest about what she can offer him vis-a-vis -vis what he can offer her. And so I wanna just, I wanna just think about that fra this phrase of equals. I mean, this is really your sense from this relationship that they, that they are truly friends. At one point you say it's kind of interesting that Vitoria seems to have mainly male friends and not women friends. And I'm curious about that too, but I wonder if you could maybe get at that through the image of Michelangelo as an equal or not. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you're right to draw attention to the fact that Michelangelo's posture towards her is often deferential. Um, he calls her divine, divina Vittoria. He always says that he, you know, he's giving her like, you know, the crucifixion drawing that's at the center of the British Library, the Pieta, you know, when he says, you know, compared to that letter you wrote to me, I have nothing to give you. So, you know, um, I don't know if it's false modesty. Um, but I, t but I'm, so part of what I was responding to when I was writing the book and writing about their friendship was the idea that she was his muse and that she had a kind of passive role. And that I really feel strongly is not right. In other words, there was, such an exchange between these two people. Um, they attended these sermons together on Sundays, and then they would talk about the content. They visited each other. Um, Michelangelo's biographer says that she came back from Viterbo when she was living there just to see him. There's a great letter when she says to him, you know, if you're not too busy, drop by the convent on your way back from the Sistine Chapel. You know, so, she, so he's sort of stopping, and then, one of the moments I like the most is they have a fight. They have a squabble where she's impatient for something that she knows he's making for her. It's the crucifixion drawing. And she says, will you just give me the drawing? He says, you've ruined my gift. Because if you, we all know this, if you ask for a gift, it loses its pleasure. Um, he says, my mio disegno e guasto. And guasto is a word for like busted. And disegno is a great word because it's both my drawing, but it's also like my purpose. Like you ruin, so if you're planning a beautiful gift for someone you love and then that person says, can you please give me that gift that you're right? So it's those moments where I see a kind of real exchange. And then, you know, the way that they respond to each other's art, they actually judge one another's art critically with appreciation, but there's a, there's a real give and take between them. So if I had to, Air in one side or the other, I would say that he looked up to her um, because he thought she was um, had a level of religious faith, and also he was learning from her. One of the things that uh, shocked me, and I imagine is shocking for people who read my book, is if you're not studying Michelangelo, to know how interested he was in Protestant reform. Um, the great artist of of all the popes uh, was really just as heavily invested as she was in the idea of Lutheranism. He was reading about it. He was engaged with the same circle. So they had this 
intellectual, spiritual contact between each other. Um, but then they talk to each other like friends. And one of the best records of their friendship is this very minor book that a minor painter wrote uh, Francesco di Olanda called on, on antique painting, but he was someone visiting Rome in the late 1530s, and he attended some sermons with Vittorio Colonna and M Michelangelo um, every you know Sunday for a little while. There was a preacher giving lessons on, on um, Paul's epistles, and he in effect transcribes their conversations. And when you hear them talking, they're disagreeing, they're fighting about whether Flemish art is better than Italian art. You know, so to me, this is a real friendship. About the gendering of the friendships, that's an interesting question. Um, she was very, very close to Marguerite de Navarre, uh, the French queen, whom she never met, but wrote lots and lots of letters to. She was close to um, her cousin, Costanza. She was close to the crazy uh, Calvinist, uh, Rene, Princess Rene. Um, but she also wrote lots of letters to Eleonora Gonzaga. There were letters between women, but I just think that those didn't get saved as much. So, I mean, I think that the problem in part is that when we're dealing with women writing to other women, who's saving those letters? Um, you know, most of the letters that we have are in the male archives. And so not, there's not the Vittoria Colonna collection, but you know, I went to the to the Michelangelo archive to read the Michelangelo letters. I went to England to read the Cardinal Pohl letters. Um, so it's also partially what counts as being worthy of being recorded. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's really, that's very striking. And um, I think that, um, but I think above and beyond that, you know, her, her circle of friends in Viterbo or in Rome um, seem to have been mainly men as well. Or yes. at least, again, yes. maybe it's only because uh, those are the visits that were somehow recorded. And those yeah. are the people who were allowed to move around. I mean, it's just That's so true. rare for a woman yeah. to have the kind of liberty she had. And part of the reason she was always staying in convents, obviously, was that that was a, a sort of safe place. That was a, that was a haven. Yeah. And we know nothing, obviously, of those exchanges with other nuns, right? Right. 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 That's, That's right. right. So that. the kind of lost part of history yeah. <laughs> would be those female friendships or those That's right. conversations. Um, no, just a little side on Michelangelo too. I mean, one, one thing that I think does make them equal in an interesting way is that you cite um, the last sonnet in the, in the anthology that she gives to him, right, in her poetry collection is a sonnet in which he's basically giving up her poems, right? And yeah. she's saying that, you know, I have a voice within me that cries to God and it has nothing to do with my style, nothing to do with my style, which is almost a kind of renunciation. And of course, Michelangelo about, well, I guess 15 years later will write one of his most famous sonnets, which, which is Giunto e gel corso della vita mia, right? You know, I've, I've, the, I've, I've come to the end of my, of my path, I've arrived at the harbor. And it's a horrible sonnet, again, I'm sure many of you know this, where he basically says, you know, I've recognized the error of my ways, you know, that art has been an idol to me. Um, and, he ends the, and he ends the sonnet saying, um, neither painting nor sculpture will be able any longer to calm my soul. So it's this amazing rejection of his art in the same way, again, that in this poem to Michelangelo, uh, at the end of her sonnet collection, she also basically says, all I want to do now is have this voice cry out to God and no longer engage in my, in my writing, no longer engage in my style. Yeah. So this, this renunciation on both their parts of their art yeah. that fed them for so long is I think just a really striking parallel. Um, I want to give our audience members a chance to ask some questions, so let me just, let me just end with, with one question. Um, you, you mentioned at one point um, that for most of the events in Vittoria Colonna's life, and I'm quoting you, there are scores of missing letters, we're kind of talking about this now, scores of missing letters and records, and we are left to piece together what must have happened from the sources that do remain. So, and you've referred to yourself as an archeologist, right, as a detective in this process, and again, the, the, the findings that you have made are just really quite wonderful, but what one thing would you like to have found that you did? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, that is such a great uh, question. Um, I. Think, I think it probably has to do with her will, um, with the decisions that went into her will. So if I can just say a little bit more about that, uh, because that's the thing that really has remained unsatisfying to me in terms of all of the pieces coming together. So the decision she made was, she gives you know, like, you know, my green velvet cloak to, you know, Carmela, and you know, she gives these little gifts. And then she says, and for the 9,000 scudi, which is the, what is that roughly equivalent to? Um, today? I don't know, but her whole dowry, which was considered enormous, was 14,000 scudi. Okay, so, so, um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense. Um, she says, you know, I'm, I'm creating a separate document 
that I'm locking up in the in the in the safe in in Venice, and no one's allowed to look at it. And if anyone asks to see it, you must forbid them from seeing it, and especially my brother, right? So she says, you know, he can't see it. And I would love to have that letter um, because in what happened afterwards, there were two things that happened afterwards. One is the initial reaction from the brother and his team. And I really see this as a scene from The Godfather, you know, that they, you know, are very angry. How could she have done this? And then they actually have a meeting with Reginald Pohl, who it turns out was the person that she gave the money to, in which he officially hands over the money. It's a, it's a, there's a notary there, and there, Gertrude from Hamlet would say, protesting too much. They keep repeating, we're doing this of our own free will. It comes up like five times, you know? So there's a sort of pressure clearly being exerted. And then, so there's this legal document three months after her death in which Reginald Pohl says, I'm going to give this money to you, to her brother Ascanio totally breaking her will. And then three years later, there's the letter that I mentioned from, uh, from Reginald Pohl to her brother saying, okay, you know, finally, now your daughter's getting married. I'm gonna give you the money because I promise, but this is going totally against what your sister wanted as she made clear in this document that I don't have, um, and so on. And just, just one anecdote about this uh, that has really stuck with me was, when I, was, when I found those different pieces, I was really puzzled and wanted to know, sort of, was there any way I could find this Venice document? I want to see the terms, what she wanted Reginald Pohl to do with that money. It was a lot of money. And so I wrote to a senior <coughs> colleague of both of ours, a, a, a prominent woman historian in Italy who works in this field. And I said, maybe you could help me. Um, you know, here are the pieces. I can't figure out what happened. And she wrote an email back. The title was all caps, Problema risolto, okay? <laughs> Problem solved, exclamation point. And then the, the, this note that she wrote to me said, there's no problem here. She says, this is the senior woman from Parma, you know, who works on this all up, do you know who this is? She said, <laughs> that's all I need to say. She said, there's no problem here. Victoria loved her niece and would have been so happy for her to have the money. And the way I understood this, and the reason I bring it up, I mean, it's a funny story, but is because I interpreted her email to me as, you don't understand Italians. Um, we love our families. She loved her niece. She, she says she always gave her nice presents. She went to visit her. So Vittoria died totally in compost mentis. She was having theological fights like the day before her, her death. She made this will two weeks or three weeks before her death, she had someone bring a document to be locked up all so that she could keep the money away from her brother. And then the senior person, senior scholar in our field is saying, oh, she would have been happy for the money to go to Vittoria. And I take this as a kind of interesting moment in terms of what kinds of questions we ask of the things we're working on. And you know, if you come into this project with that mentality, then you're not going to go looking for these documents because it's fine that she gave the money to her niece. But coming from my, you know, American perspective, I thought this is, you know, literally her will was violated. You know, this was what she wanted to do. And so I would just love to have that letter. <laughs> that's great. Well, I think that's all worth us all going out and hunting for. <laughs> Um, well, Remy, thank you. It's been wonderful having the chance to chat. And, and now from our audience, if anyone has questions, as I'm sure you all do. Yes, sir. Just to follow up on what you just said, has there been a reaction um, in Italy to your book? Um, well, my book just came out two weeks ago in English, and it hasn't yet come out in Italian, which we hope it will uh, soon, sooner rather than later. But so there hasn't, as far as I know, been any reaction yet from the Italians who, I don't know how much they're going to be reading this in English. Um, I, assume, I hope some people will, but I imagine there will be uh, much more of a conversation when, when an Italian edition hopefully appears. Is that planned? It's, it's hoped for, and, and now that the book's out, we will, we will <laughs> hopefully make sure that happens. Wayne, back. Uh, was it common for women to have a will at that time? Yes. Yes. I mean, women with property, yes. 
may have related to her issues uh, regarding sexuality and the convent. And I mean, there were just repeated, repeated themes that indicate to me that there were some issues with her femininity, well, with her sexuality. Yeah, I mean, I, I see I see where you want to go. And if you had written the book, you might have found uh, who knows what from the nunnery. But um, what I would say is, I don't know if you were here at the beginning, but the the repeated mentions of her sterility and that she talks about being infertile on multiple occasions suggest they were clearly in a sexual relationship. Um, she was very upset that she didn't have children. She expresses, and also that letter that I read about being one flesh, you know, she really felt a connection to him. After Ferrante's death, um, she never had a sexual relationship that left any traces. But she fell really quite madly in love with Reginald Pohl. Mm -hmm. And we can understand that in any number of ways. But it was an intense, I mean, she says, I long only for you. I desire only you. I mean, the, the language, I don't know if you were struck by it, but it's, it's, it it's erotically very intense. Um, so Reginald Pohl, unfortunately for her, was actually gay and was in a was in a long, long term, lifelong partnership with Alvise Priuli, a, a Venetian nobleman, whom actually they asked to be buried together and spend eternity together. So they had a beautiful lifelong sort of marriage, and she and Priuli hated each other. And there's tons of letters where she says Priuli is keeping me from seeing Paul. So there's a kind of triangle there. Um, she also had a very intense emotional relationship to Michelangelo, who also didn't, didn't have sexual relationships with women. Um, we don't know fully what his sexual relations were. It's very hard to know what people's sexual relations actually were. Um, but I would absolutely um, say that she felt passionate love for her husband, for Reginald Paul, and to some extent to Michelangelo. The decision not to remarry, I think, was probably less about sex than about everything that came with marriage, which was going to take her completely back into someone else's fold. So, so I, I would say we, we, couldn't, we couldn't assume anything from that. But didn't women remarry in those days? Yeah, women remarried. I mean, as, as, I, as I said, that, that sense is one in 10 women in their 30s remarried. But then aristocratic women married. I mean, if we think about Lucrezia Borgia, who got remarried every two or three years, because these, these marriages were a way to create new alliances. I mean, it was so, such a, but see, if you think about Lucrezia Borgia, if anybody knows her story, I'm sure some of you do, it was always her father and, you know, and her brother, but they were scheming. And here, we're sort of lacking that male figure who would need to make the marriage. Her brother didn't yeah, need and it. Her brother, the fact that her brother does not yeah, it's push her into this is very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, he's obviously not, he doesn't lack for forcefulness. No, no, it is um, really interesting. And yet in this context. And again, that's another letter or conversation I would love to have heard uh, yeah. between her and her brother about this. Okay, look for that too when you're out in the archives. <laughs> yes. say what I would say is it's so tempting to try to create a story that will make sense of symptoms but what as a historian I try to do is is actually resist that kind of move and just look at the context in which these things what 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 do we know what do we know and what we do know just to respond to to what you're saying is that there was rampant anorexia in in convents in the Renaissance. Actually, 
so predominant that it was considered a kind of ecclesiastical crisis. Why were the nuns starving themselves? I mean, if you had met them, you probably would have found there are lots of reasons. But what we know is that nuns were starving themselves as an act of extreme devotion. So there's actually a beautiful book by Rudolf Bell called Holy Anorexia. Um, or no, he, he calls it Holy Anorexia, Holy Fast, Holy Feast. Um, but Holy Yeah, it is Holy Anorexia, right? It's Carolyn Bonham's book, yeah, Holy Fast, Holy Feast. So there have been wonderful books about this, but the idea was that I shouldn't need any more nutrition, any more nourishment than Christ's body in the Eucharist wafer. So instead of eating food, I'm just eating these few bites. So that's, that's the kind of thing that was going on, and they actually had to bring authorities in regularly. Um, she was not recorded as anorexic or as self-flagellating before her husband's death. So all of this did come on afterwards. But I know there were a lot of other questions. So we should... yes. well, you mentioned uh, that a doctor was sent to treat her for syphilis. No, 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 no. A doctor who discovered a treatment for syphilis came, in other words, a medical expert who worked on syphilis, this was a way of saying he was a very important doctor, came to see Vittoria Colonna to treat her for her totally unrelated. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> not I want to get that straight now. My husband is very likely a suspect. Young man? Ask something? Yeah. Okay. I am interested in understanding, you have spoken a lot about uh, Cardinal Reginald Paul and uh, the penchant for uh, uh, reform. And uh, what about this movement of spirituals in which she was linked to Paul and Michelangelo? <coughs> did, did you find something related to that, something more, I mean, about such a movement of spiritual? You're asking about the, the spirituali? Yeah, yeah, the, the spirit, so the Spirituali were a group based in no, Naples. No, no, I'm telling. Ah, okay. were they, was she linked to them? Um, whose leader was Juan de Valdez. And Valdez and Vittoria Colonna were directly linked, as were most of the circle in Viterbo. So there was a, there was a, there, basically, we think about the Reformation as coming from the north of Europe, but there were lots of reform movements going on in Spain in Naples, in, then they moved to Viterbo. So she was directly linked to the Spanish reformers who were in Naples. And then when Valdez died, they sort of reformulated themselves in Viterbo. Is that what you're asking about? Oh, yeah. And just if you ever found something more about that, because it's uncertain, the situation. Also because Paul was a representative of England and more than Germany. I yeah, but Paul had no connection to Germany, but Paul was actually at this point a cardinal in the Catholic Church and the papal legate of Viterbo, so he had a lot of power. Um, but the group of sort of Spanish, Neapolitan, Roman reformers was not directly linked to Luther. They were really on no, their own. Exactly. You know, they had their own thing going on, yeah. and it's only because they lost that we now think about reform as a, as a predominantly German movement. But there was the, the, the preacher whom I sort of alluded to that Vittoria was following around like she was on a, on a lecture tour with him um, from city to city, Ber Bernardino Ochino. Ochino and Valdez were, were best friends or were in close, close contact. And, and you know, Ochino escaped to Switzerland where he was leading a group of Italian reformers who had all fled to get out of Italy. So Italy almost had a reformation and it wasn't just Lutheran. It wasn't even predominantly Lutheran. It was also coming from these other circles and, and you're absolutely right. Yeah, at the same time as you say, she's in touch with Ignatius Loyola, right? Right, I mean, absolutely. So, again, yes, I mean, and asking him to send people yeah, over yeah. to help the nuns. So yeah. it's, it's not clear who's who, right, in this okay. in this When you say that after and that she was uh, under the exam of Inquisition, you were referring to this movement. Obviously yes, that's right. right. She, so she was put on, tr she was, they, the Inquisition prepared the documents to put her on trial after her death. And this was all part of their coming down very hard on her circle from Viterbo, these Italian reformers, many of whom were executed. So, you yeah. know, her group yeah. was kind of killed. Paul was recalled in England. Yes, and Paul was, was in England, but they wanted to get him back to Rome so that they could put him on trial, and he died before that happened. It was a coincidence with the, the election of a new pope. Yes, so we should talk about this later. Let me get a few other, so, other hands. Yes. That's okay. Yes, um, I read the, the, the Michelangelo biography, the 800-page 
one which shocked me when it talked about Savonarolo, who I always thought of as being very anti-art, and then to find out that Michelangelo was actually a follower of his. And I was just wondering if you would talk at all about the anti-art implications. Here you have these two people who are good friends and they're poets. Michelangelo is this great sculptor. And yet they're, they're following this direction, this religious direction that seems like it's very connected with anti-art. And what, what do you make of that? Yeah, I mean, when Jane was referring earlier to the fact that at late stages in both Vittorio's and Michelangelo's careers, they seem to renounce art. Right. And that is the sort of ultimate gesture of turning yourself completely over to religion. Mm -hmm. But until that point, what I would say is that for both of them, religious art was a devotional tool. Um, it was the vehicle for getting at their deepest spiritual feelings. And it's really interesting that the religious works that were exchanged, like if you think about the drawings that Michelangelo gave to her, they are intense private moments. This is not the last judgment with lots and lots of bodies and lots of people. These are moments of exquisite intimacy between Christ and his mother, um, between, he gave her the first drawing that, that he made for her, it was of the Nolomi Tangare, so of the, of the Magdalene coming before Christ and his putting out his hand. So these are moments that suggest a kind of intimacy, a personal experience of religion that is absolutely compatible with the reform movement. Um, so I would say that there's a kind of, we, we often think because the Protestants whitewashed the churches and took down you know, the altars, we think of Protestantism as sort of anti-art, but that's not true. It's anti a certain kind of art. Well, and it's anti- Well, that's much earlier. I mean, you know, because that's, that's, yeah. that's before this period. Um, but I would say that Michelangelo for most, I mean, I'm not a Michelangelo expert, but in his exchanges with Vittoria, he talks about art as something that is a vehicle for achieving something else. So art as an end in itself, maybe is, is more, would be a better way to answer your question, seems to be pushed aside, but art as a way to get at what it is that they want to stimulate inside of themselves. So whether it's reading the Bible or listening to sermons or painting, I mean, she says of his crucifixion drawing, she says, the image was crucified in my heart. That's what she says. And so that idea of internalizing the image, of taking it in and making it sort of meaningful, that was never renunciation at all. Okay. Peter Savarillo had painters like Fra Bartolomeo, right? And yes, that's right. That's you know, right. went on and, and, and did extensive work after Savarillo's But the death. kind of so Baroque, a, ornate, yeah. that decorative art, no. Yeah. Time for a couple more questions, yes. In a time when family was so important and having children was women's main role and a husband who's an unfaithful, was there any talk of annulment in this relationship? <laughs> Absolutely not. There definitely <laughs> wouldn't have been annulment. I mean, first of all, as I, as I uh, suggested in the brief reading, and as you'll see if you read the book, she was very devoted to him. Um, so there was never any suggestion anywhere in- On his part, I'm asking. Oh, on his part. No, he benefited tremendously from this marriage. Um, this connected him to one of the most powerful families in Rome. Her father was the grand constable of the kingdom of Naples. They owned 14 feudal properties outside. They owned like most of the Castello Romani. So this was a very good match. His not having an heir was less of a problem than you might think because he was able to pass on his name to his cousin, Alfonso Davalos. Um, and that was very common in this period too. So annulment was definitely never on the table and I, I can't imagine that um, that was something that was in practice. I don't know if you know more about what it. Happened, but, but usually but, when, when a marriage wasn't consummated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and this marriage was, was definitely consummated. Um, that we know. <laughs> um, one last question, yes. Yeah, you probably even addressed this in the book but I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> What you just said that the Pope wouldn't let her become a nun? What if she was so devotional and w wanted to live in convents and wanted to be a nun? Why, why wouldn't he want her to be? This is one of the moments. It's a, it's a really good question. One of the moments that um, takes me back to my opening remarks, where I'm left trying to make sense of something that doesn't make a lot of sense. So why wouldn't he let her be a nun? What is it to him? We have. We have a letter from him to the head of the nunnery, 
saying, please be very nice to Vittoria, be nice to her servants, treat them well, give them extra food, do what you like, but under no circumstances, let her take the veil. And he threatens to excommunicate her, the, nun, the head of the nunnery. If she, he says, she's very sad, she's not thinking properly, she's in mourning, you know, don't let her become a nun. So why would he do that? And my best answer, and this is again, sort of reconstructing things backwards, is that he needed her. He needed her because she was the most sane member of her family. She was incredibly talented as a diplomat. And this isn't my making things up, but it's evidenced by the fact that we have lots and lots of letters in which she's actively negotiating between the Pope, the Holy Roman Emperor, and her brother. So they're writing to her. And there are diplomats writing to her from Germany saying, you need to get your brother under control. So her brother was one of the most powerful, they call them the Baroni, the powerful landowners in, in Italy. He had tremendous territory that was under his control. And he was probably crazy. I mean, he certainly was unreliable. So in the aftermath of her asking to be a um, nun, within six months, her brother and the Pope were at war. They were fighting an active war which led to the sack of Rome in 1527. <laughs> so they, they really needed a sane Colonna. And this isn't the only time that happened. It happened again in 1541 with the Salt War, where there was another war between her brother. Her brother and the Pope were constantly going to war. And they kept saying, we have letters from you know, all of these diplomats saying, ask Vittoria. So she really became very valuable to them. That's my best guess. Yeah. Yeah, good guess. And I think that your curiosity and appetites have been whetted um, for more. There are books for sale upstairs. I'm sure Professor Targoff would be happy to sign them. Um, but first, I just want to say that as a Renaissance scholar myself, you know, one thing, so I know everything about the Renaissance, but having read your book, there was so much I learned that I didn't oh. know and brought wonderful ways for me together in terms of thinking about this remarkably interesting period and this remarkably interesting woman. So please join me in thanking Professor Targoff for so much presentation.